Hello and welcome to the NIGP webinar, Making Agile Procurement a Reality in Your Organization. Today's webinar is being brought to you courtesy of Bonfire. <coughs> For those of you who have attended NIGP webinars in the past, you know that from time to time we ask someone from outside NIGP to provide their expertise and unique insight into an important issue we want to highlight to our audience. Across the years, those experts have represented both the public and private sectors, academia, and the nonprofit communities. All webinar content is presented strictly for educational purposes only and is not intended to be an endorsement of our speakers, organization, products, or services. Today's presentation is moderated by Amanda Bala and presented by Patrick Moore and Omar Salemi. Patrick has spent his career working to improve government and its responsiveness to citizens. Patrick spent eight years working for Georgia's governor, Sonny Perdue, serving as state CIO from 2006 to 2010. During that time, Patrick led a transformational restructuring of the state's technology function, establishing a new model for Georgia's IT strategy. Upon leaving Georgia's government, Patrick served in client-facing and sales executive roles with HP Enterprise Services, where he focused on building and delivering solutions for state and local governments. Patrick now serves as managing partner for Integra Supplied, a management consulting firm focused on CIOs and their organizations. Patrick is a noted expert in the state and local government technology space and a government technology top 25 doer, dreamer, and driver. He is a frequent contributor to industry organizations, including the Center for Digital Government and NASIO. Omar is the Executive Director of Customer Success at Bonfire. Omar focuses on ensuring user success for all Bonfire clients, including onboarding, training, and UI and UX analysis. He is passionate about enabling procurement professionals to be more effective and successful in their roles, including speaking at conferences and user groups about the importance of user-friendly software. Omar is also, also enjoys creating thought leadership content about user success and software adoption. Amanda is a strategic communications professional working in the procurement space. In her current role, Amanda manages marketing programs, working with the Bonfire team to create thought-provoking, engaging, and helpful content for pure procurement leaders. If at any time during the webinar you need technical assistance, please let us know in the Q&A box. During the presentation, you may submit questions to the Q&A box on your screen, and we will take them during specified parts of the presentation. Amanda, would you like to go ahead and get us started? Yes, thank you very much for the introduction, and thanks to everyone on the line who's joining us today. And a big thank you as well to Patrick and Omar for being here today to discuss this topic. In today's webinar, we'll be diving deeper into the topic of agile procurement. We'll start with a thorough introduction to the topic and take a look at some concrete ways that public organizations can start to become more agile in their processes. So on the agenda for today, we'll begin with a quick primer on agile procurement, what it is, when and why it's used, and some of the obstacles or perceived obstacles holding back adoption in this area. Then we'll get into some tactical examples of how it plays out in a procurement process from before, during, and then after the RFP. Finally, we'll look at how organizations can get started with agile. Even if you're not ready to jump in right now, we'll review what skills you can build or questions you can ask to plant the seed and get your organization starting to think in this way. So first things first, for those who are new to the topic, what is agile procurement? Patrick, it would be great if you could start us off with a description of this. No, thank you, and, and happy to, and, and thank you for having me on today and uh, look forward to, to the discussion. Um, you know, I think everybody is going to have their own thoughts on what agile means. Uh, we're using that term a lot in the industry now, not just around procurements, but around application development. Um, and we're seeing, you know, we're seeing this is turning into a, a buzzword. Um, but I think it's doing so for a reason, and that is uh, it's giving us a different way of approaching um, traditional challenges that, that need to move at a, at a faster, um, but, still, um, but still in a manner that we can validate. Um, and, and so what, what do we call that? We call these things agile, which, which means we're able to adapt, we're able to adjust, we're able to make changes as we go. So if we think about a traditional process um, that provides potential vendors with a detailed out, outline of a solution, um, works well for problems with a known solution, um, and has a focus on specifications and process, I think a lot of us 
who have been involved in procurements in, in their careers can probably relate to one, if not all of those points. Um, you go out and you tell the marketplace, this is what we want. This is what we expect you to provide. You go through this list of all of these things that, that you, you or your organization has done over the years and expects them to do in the future. You go forward with a procurement that usually involves a lot of document exchanges. You score it. You then go out and you sign some, some winner. And, and then, you know, depending on the complexity of the solution, um, you, you're, you're making adjustments or you're dealing with what those outcomes uh, of your procurement look like downstream. Um, We've all had success stories with, with a traditional procurement process. We've also all had horror stories um, with a traditional procurement process. And I think we're going to see some data in, in this presentation that speaks to some of that. Um, so so as, as we're starting to think about the way in which um, the customer experience, the citizen experience, our experiences for that matter, are, is changing, and the way in which we get goods and services now it, it, it's completely different. We're doing it in screens. We're looking at the world through a piece of glass. And, and that means that government is trying to adapt to the way that, that citizens expect to get services from government, um, which means buying processes need to adapt because the market's moving quicker, which gets us to this agile procurement concept um, that, that begins to do more in terms of, of an iterative approach, presenting potential vendors um, with a problem and inviting them to solve it rather than dictating to them the, the, the steps, the requirements that they have to fulfill. Um, it oftentimes works best for a, a complex, quickly evolving market. Um, but, and, and the idea behind that is it, it's intended to uh, create more engagement and more dialogue during a, both before the procurement process begins and during the procurement process itself. Um, as you learn more about a solution, as you learn more about a supplier, or about, as the suppliers learn more about the customers, being able to adapt and, and adjust solutions helps everybody along the way and gets you to a better outcome. And, and then that leads us to the final bullet point, that there is more of a focus on the outcomes. Um, strate procurements, procurements need to be viewed in a different context than, than what they're viewed in today. We're going to get to that in a little bit. I won't steal that thunder. Um, but, but right now, I, I think that this is a pretty good tee up of what we're going to talk about today uh, around agile and what agile means. Definitely. And I think we all have heard it a little bit as a buzzword. So I think it's great to have more structure and definition to it and really understanding what the difference is between that idea of traditional tendering versus agile. So now that we have a solid understanding of the difference between the two, let's take a further look into why organizations choose agile, including some of the reasoning behind the concept. And really, let's, we're going to take a look at what's at stake that requires us and organizations to change the approach that's currently been using in the marketplace. And you can see in this chart here that we're looking at the fact that there really are frustrations on both sides of the purchasing relationship. On the governmental side, we see frustration with the way procurement is done. There's often poor outcomes and no way to change them after a decision has been made. And then there's also this risk of getting locked in with a contractor that perhaps isn't the best fit. And then looking at what the market sees from their perspective, there's oftentimes a thought that it's very difficult to do business with government. There's this very long sales cycle that's very difficult to participate in and to get through. Also, vendors oftentimes find that, you know, there are inconsistent processes between government, so they're always having to change and do things differently. And then also not being able to propose a solution that produces the right results. Sometimes in that kind of traditional RFP, vendors are locked into offering something that perhaps they know doesn't produce the right results or doesn't solve that innate need that you're looking to have solved. And some interesting stats here, and I think these might be the ones that you were uh, alluding to, Patrick, uh, they really bring this issue to light. The Standish Group looked at thousands of IT procurement projects over $10 million. And they found that of those procurement projects, only 6.4% were successful. 52% of them were defined as being challenged, meaning that they were over budget, behind schedule, or they didn't even meet the expectations that were set out at the onset of the project. And the remaining 41.4% were deemed as failures. They were either abandoned or had to start anew just from scratch. I'm sure those of you joining us today have come across some of these examples, either in the news or your own experience of procurement outcomes that end up as, you know, these kind of unhappy compromises that you're not really able to change after the fact. 
And the bottom line really is that, as Patrick outlined, to adapt to this changing market, you really need a process that's adaptable. So continuing to look at why agile procurement is necessary, let's take a deeper dive into a strategic event versus a buying process. Patrick, can you walk us through the difference between these two and give us a little bit more background? Yeah, thank you. And, and I think that, uh, I think that the, um, the procurement process um, is, is, due for, is due for an elevation in its status in the things that governments do. Um, there, there's, it's much more involved than people understand. There's lots of moving pieces. And as much as it can get a bad rap from both participants within it as well as um, folks that are trying to, to engage with it, um, th there's a lot that goes on to make an, uh, an outcome uh, effective for all parties. And, and with, with that in mind, I think increasingly the procurement process needs to be thought of as something that is strategic and something that sets the stage for relationships that are going to last long term. And again, I'm, I'm saying most of this in the context of more complex procurements that typically involve um, technologies or, or, or larger companies or, or longer term relationships where you're going to have to constantly be adjusting um, what it is you and the other party are, are agreeing to and, and what you're getting, what both parties are getting. Um, I think it's, it sometimes can be lost on, on folks that when you're engaging with, with larger entities, you're also managing a relationship, not just an outcome. And that can be a hard thing to do. So beginning to look at the procurement process as the, the, the framework and the, the cornerstone for the outcomes that are going to last for years I mean, people think about how long your, your procurement process can take, um, but then think about the types of contracts that are being signed and how long those are, those are going to last, two years, three years, five years, seven years, and upwards. You're, you're entering into long-term relationships. And to get those right, laying that groundwork up front means that procurement process has to be seen as a more strategic um, activity rather than just buying a service or buying a process. Uh, it's not so simple as getting through it all, signing a contract and saying that it's done. That, that procurement process and the thinking around it needs to be integrated into the way that the organization is going to think about delivering those outcomes and the way that the suppliers are going to be engaged um, in providing those outcomes over the longer term. Those are all great points, and I think it's a really important uh, way of looking at it to ensure that you really are setting that project up for success and really having those solid relationships that will carry through to a, a positive result. So taking a deeper look here at agile adoption, uh, governing institutes national survey of state procurement officials found that nearly two thirds of respondents named agile development as one of the formal methods of central procurement that an organization uses or plans to use to reduce costs and improve how common goods and services are purchased. The local government on the education level is seeing some adoption, but it's less widespread. So speaking of adoption, we wanted to turn quickly to you, our audience, and just gain a better understanding of where your organization stands regarding agile procurement. So for anyone on the line who's not currently using a model of agile procurement, what do you perceive to be the largest obstacle to um, introducing agile procurement into your organization? So that could be that you don't know enough about it, you don't have capacity on your team, don't think that it's allowed within rules and regulations that you are currently working within, or don't have leadership level support. So we'll just give you a bit of time to uh, take a look at those options and, and let us know your thoughts. Yeah, and we'll keep this up for another five seconds. And Amanda, hear the results? Perfect, thank you. So, interestingly, it says that 56% uh, of those joining us today don't know enough about it. And so I think it's fantastic that then we're having this conversation today. Hopefully we can give you some great insights and answer a lot of your questions surrounding this. 20% uh, of you don't feel you have capacity on the team, 
And then 14% don't think it's allowed within rules and regulations. And then lastly, 9% don't have leadership level support. So looking at this idea that 56% or just over half of those joining us today don't know enough about agile procurement to introduce it, Patrick, is that something common to what you are experiencing and what you would expect to see? Well, it certainly is an interesting counterpoint to the previous graphic that said two thirds of, of central procurement um, organizations are using agile um, procurement today. It'd be interesting to get a little bit um, deeper into that data because I would I, I was curious um, on on that uh, on that particular um, item of information myself. Um, so so I think I, I don't know that I'm I'm surprised by this. I think it's um, I think that it gets into how you define agile and and helping people understand that agile oftentimes applies um, to, to your specific circumstances within a, within a government environment. So um, it might be different in, a, in the state of Georgia than it might be in a county or, or in the state of California or whatever it may be. But the basic premise of what Agile is, um, being, able to, uh, being able to adjust solutions and pricing as you go through a process, being able to have open dialogue amongst parties and doing so in a documented way so that all parties realize that everybody's being treated the exact same way as you go through those steps. Those basic principles of agile apply no matter where you are. So then implementing the practices behind it and, and, and getting folks to help you kind of walk through it once or two times, one or two times um, to, to get the hang of, of what, what all this means. You know, those are definitely things that, that, um, that we see are, are, are beneficial to teams. But, you know, I can, I can understand how folks, absolutely understand how folks don't yet know enough about it because, you know, in my experience, uh, it, it just, I haven't seen the application of it um, to the extent that, that I know it's possible. Um, but, but I've certainly seen more adoption of the, the, the concepts behind it. Great. And Omar, are you seeing something similar with customers and clients that you're working with in this space? Yeah, Amanda, I do actually. And I would say A, it doesn't surprise me. Um, there's not enough uh, out there, not enough material or, uh, or people actually doing agile, specifically, as you mentioned earlier, uh, specifically at local government, um, you know, school districts, etc. Uh, the other one, though, that I do see from time to time is people might know about it, but they don't think it's actually allowed within the rules and regulations. And I know we'll dig into this a little bit more, but those are the two that uh, I've seen more frequently. Great. Thanks to both of you for your insight on that. So before we go any further, let's address one of the possible barriers. And it's a question that some of you might be thinking and might have thought before joining this webinar which is basically, is this even allowed? How does this idea of agile procurement work within rules and regulations? Patrick, have you found that policy changes or anything of that nature is necessary before implementing an agile model? Yeah, I, I, love, I love this, um, this particular graphic. Uh, th this is such a, a, a true, uh, just a true depiction of of, of the, the kind of contrast that we've seen in, in, doing, in doing work with governments on, on this very topic. Um, and, and that's, I, I have never seen the need for policy changes to do um, the types of, of um, iterative approaches that, that we've advocated in doing work with, with um, government clients. Um, a lot of it is custom and practice. Um, and it's a belief that has developed over years to the point that people know it to be true. Um, but if you really look at the source and you really look at, at the root of, of that particular um, knowledge or, or belief set, um, you see that it's not grounded in law or it's not even grounded in a regulation. It's something that sprung up over the years because people were, um, they didn't want to step on somebody's toes or they were afraid of a, of a um, bad outcome or a protest. And so the, the, the lore, the custom, the wisdom, using the words on the slide, um, have, have turned into the truth. And then when you challenge that truth, you, you can see that you have a lot more flexibility within, within procurement regulations and procurement law um, than, than one uh, would usually imagine. Great. Yeah, this visual really, we wanted to depict this idea of, you know, the red rules and the blue rules and really being able to distinguish between the two. And it's actually identified by David Eaves of 
Harvard Kennedy School, and again, red rules, those rules you cannot break as they're in the law, and then those blue rules, as you mentioned, Patrick, which are more lore or wisdom that has been accumulated over the years. And so really the idea that agile methodologies are not permitted really does fall into that latter category. Yeah, and if I could chime in uh, on this, Amanda, um, like consider this, the use of flexible formats, if we consider this dialogue uh, format to be one of those, in procurement is actually uh, broadly recognized and adopted by international standards. And this includes the UN model procurement law. Uh, and these, these formats are used heavily in the EU, and we're just kind of starting to see them come uh, to North America. Um, also, it's important to kind of keep in mind that typically by the time a new procurement format is incorporated into international standards or even local and state standards, that means it's come uh, to reflect that it's widely accepted already in the industry as, a, as an industry practice. So what we can take away from that is these agile methodologies must work you know, private sectors doing them, we're seeing them more and more, uh, like I mentioned, in the EU, and it's just a matter of adoption here in North America. Great, thank you both for that insight. And of course, when you're looking at the different rules, you always want to ensure that your procurement decisions are defensible. When it comes to agile procurement, the most important items to remember are being clear and upfront in communication with internal and external stakeholders, documenting everything very well, and having leadership and support. So for example, in municipalities, this would come from the city manager level, and in state agencies, this would be either your CIO or your commissioner. <clears throat> so let's now walk through the process so we can get a clearer picture of how agile procurement really does unfold in real life. We'll take a look at engaging the market, building the RFP itself, and then moving through to evaluating the RFP. So the first step before you really dive in is to build your stakeholder group. Patrick, in your experience, how do you get people on board to do something that might be a little bit outside the norm of what the organization normally does? Yeah, this is, um, and, and I think that as we're, you know, talking about doing things new, I, I think it's a challenge. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter if you're in government. It doesn't matter um, if you're dealing with your teenager at home. Trying to trying to bring change about is is always a difficult thing. Um, but identifying, and I think I think that that journey usually begins with um, identifying the burning platform, the reason to change, and then helping helping the stakeholders that, that you're um, bringing on board understand what's in it for them. Um, how are they going to become a hero to the story of making the change um, improve something? And how is it going to make their lives or their jobs uh, just a little bit easier? Um, so, so it starts with having a vision. Uh, the, the individual has to, or the, the group of individuals that, that sits there as the, the, the drivers of the leaders, um, have to know that, that there's an end in mind and that there's an objective that they're trying to achieve. Um, and then from there, uh, describing that objective, helping other people um, jump on that, that, you know, the jump on the, the, the train to head there and, and helping them see why it's going to benefit them and how they're going to come out with, with a compelling story to tell the folks that, that they need to influence. Um, that's, that's, that happens at the outset and, and bringing them along on the story uh, as early as possible um, becomes the trick, and then and then keeping them keeping them engaged as you go through a process of change um, is is then part of the you know, part of the job of the person that sees the need to make improvements or sees the need to do something a little differently. Definitely, and I think that idea of you know crafting that story and how they're going to come along that journey and really what it's going to mean for them is a fantastic way of of really putting it and does apply to a lot of other things, no matter what it is that you're trying to push forward in your organization. Omar, in your experience working with the procurement community, is there anything else that our listeners should keep in mind when trying to encourage organizational change that falls outside the norm? Yeah, I would say uh, start with reliance on data. We shared some data points earlier, uh, namely 6.4% success rate when it comes to IT uh, procurements. And so you want to start with that to paint the picture for stakeholders for why the process needs to change to achieve better outcomes. And kind of related to this, there's a book uh, I, I picked up recently called Start With Why, and it kind of relates to this because the concept, as Patrick mentioned, kind of applies across the board where it's, it's colleagues at work or even children at home. Um, 
And, and that is, you know, when you start with why, um, you, you get people to buy in into the idea and you show them that we're not doing this for the sake of a process, but because as we mentioned earlier, there's a high failure rate for these types of projects. And that's something in common that many people have, whether it's a movement to try to convince people to buy into a product, a service or, or something new. Uh, because once you, you explain the why and you involve those stakeholders in the process, they feel like they're part of the decision making and then you have buy-in. And once you have buy-in, uh, really they're gonna be more collaborative and help you along the way. And then the rest of it should be easy. Great, so you both really hit on this idea of the outcome and or the why, which is obviously something very important for our audience to keep in mind as they're moving either this or another initiative forward. So once your stakeholders see the value and you have the supportive leadership in doing things differently, this really kicks off the way that you then engage with the market. Patrick, putting together a team that will write and evaluate the RFP, who do you suggest should be involved in that? You want, it needs to be a cross-functional team and it needs to be um, folks from across the organization and within the customer base that the, the change or the procurement will affect. Um, and, and engaging them up at the beginning of a process, engaging them even before the RFPs are out, learning what the market is producing, um, what the market is capable of doing, what the market can and can't do, um, and, and helping them to start understanding what to ask for and how to ask for it um, is really that first step. And then bringing them along through that, through that, um, through that effort of, of then writing the RFPs, evaluating the RFPs, um, brings them in as an end-to-end -end owner of a solution. And then by picking the folks that are also going to be end users, you're, you're now creating champions for the change within the customer base that the, the procurement will affect. So, uh, you know, to, to get more precise on your answer, it, it's got to be folks. I mean, there's a traditional host of, of, of um, functions, if you will, that, that have to be included in any type of procurement evaluation. You have to have your, 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 your financial folks looking at the numbers. You have to have some technical expertise evaluating solutions. Um, you have to have some business-minded um, folks that are helping, helping look at the, the whole thing. But, but more importantly, getting, getting those types of functions from within the customer base and getting end users also to help sit on those various evaluation committees that, that, that come up with the final answer for a procurement um, becomes a, a real important part of the process so that you do have um, those people that can say, I helped do that. Here's why we did it. Um, it's going to work for these reasons. And if it doesn't, here's what we're going to do about it. Uh, it it's got to be more than just the folks that are sitting in that procurement function. You've got to have people around you that are going to help support, you know, the why of what you did. So, of what you did. Definitely fantastic idea to bring in those end users and really keep that customer at the center of everything that you're doing. So once you do have this team set up, the next step is to engage in the market. And in a traditional process, you might do some research to understand what the market is doing, but the agile process places a lot more emphasis on this early part of the process before the RFP is live or even scheduled. Patrick, can you walk us through what teams are doing in this pre-RFP period? Yeah, I think this, this area gets, um, I don't think this gets enough attention. I think that you know, traditional ideas like, like an RFI um, is seen as a way of doing market research. And I've, I see frequently folks saying, oh, well, we did an RFI. We know what the market does. Well, you don't really. And, and the RFIs only scratch the surface. And they're also seen by the market. Uh, and, and I'm going to caveat this in a moment. But they're typically seen as a market as an exercise that's going to go nowhere. They're, and, and so they don't put their best people responding to them. They don't really think about the RFI as an opportunity to explain what it is they're doing as well as they could or should. And therefore, it becomes a lost opportunity. However, if, if an RFI is seen as, part, as a step in a longer process where the market is going to be engaged and where that RFI is going to be acted on by the purchasing organization, then suddenly it takes on a little more importance. And, and what do I mean by that? Well, if, if, the, if the RFI is, is communicated as a, a step uh, and, and an organization says, all right, marketplace, here's what we plan to do. Uh, we, we are in the process of evaluating solutions to solve this type of a problem. We're looking for these types of responses to these questions, 
And we're going to select the five best respondents based on these criteria to come in and talk with us about what you're doing and how you're doing it. So now you've created a reason for them to respond. You've created an opportunity for the marketplace to come and explain to you something face to face. And you've told the marketplace that you're going to use this information to inform the way you're going to go out and ask for an RFP. You're doing this all before the RFP is, is being let. And you're doing this all in a transparent and documented way, working within procurement regulations and working with procurement teams. So suddenly you're, you're creating a little bit of momentum, not just within your own group, but also within the marketplace. And you're letting the market know that they need to start preparing to respond to something, whether it's you know, two months out or six months out or eight months out, having that kind of transparency with the market gets them ready and gets them excited. It makes it easier for them to marshal the resources they need within their own leadership chain to give the, the, the buying organization the best team possible to respond to an RFP and ultimately deliver a solution. And how do you suggest that teams ensure fairness to these suppliers? And how do they ensure that these suppliers, you know, have a good understanding of what's going on? I, I think that, I think that it gets into, it gets into the communications that are sent to the marketplace <laughs> and it's being clear and precise in what it is you're asking for and why and where you are in a process. Um, what I've what I've typically experienced, and I'm sure there are always exceptions, is that uh, in this particular in an RFI process before you're in front of a procurement, that you can do anything you want in terms of talking to the market for the most part. So you can tell them we're gonna we're gonna take these, we're gonna ask for RFIs, we're gonna ask for the we're gonna ask these questions, um, we're gonna have a small team look at them, and we're gonna ask. Um, some or even all of you in to explain, um, you know, what's going on in the marketplace. Or you can just, you can, you can have, have an industry day where you're inviting suppliers in to talk about a particular business problem that, that might lead to a procurement. But I think, I think that transparency and, and that engagement with the marketplace not only benefits you from a procurement standpoint, but it also allows the market to be more creative um, because they can see the problem and they're, they're, they're being asked what their opinion is. And that, that helps generate a little bit of, of energy with, with folks that are out there trying to, you know, trying to engage, trying to sell business and, and, you know, trying to, you know, do the things that they do. Right. And you're probably getting a lot of different solutions and options too, that you wouldn't have normally received if it was just a, a straight RFP that they had to kind of work with in the box. So that's great. That's right. And you're looking for what you're also looking for what not to ask for. Sometimes folks want to ask for things that the market simply can't or won't do, or they'll do it at an exorbitant cost. And, and knowing that before you walk into a process where you're now either building your statements of work or you're building your requirements, knowing that ahead of time helps inform what you're going to ask for and, and potentially the implications that a, a particular request might have on a price that you receive. Definitely. There's a lot of knowledge to be gained there, I think, to really set it up for success, which is fantastic to know. So now that we understand the pre-RFP period, let's take a look at what happens during the build of an RFP in this type of a model. So once you've engaged with the market to get more of an understanding of what's out there, Patrick, how do you approach the actual writing of the RFP itself? Yeah, the experience um, that, that that we've had um, and that I've had is, is more of a solutions-based approach. And, and the idea behind this is you're asking somebody, a, a, a company, to, to provide a solution for you that is based on and, and that certain outcomes must be hit and certain service levels, certain metrics must be met along the way. You're not telling them how to do it. And, and that's part, and, and that, that cuts both ways. First of all, it, it develops some creativity and allows a, a service provider or, or a supplier to come in with maybe a different approach. They're not being dictated to. Um, it also helps preserve ground um, in these debates about what is or isn't required. Um, we, I see frequently these elaborate requirements documents that are built, um, and people go through line by line and say, well, they have to do this, and they have to do this, and they're, they're, they're doing this, we're doing this today, we need them to do this. And it doesn't matter how well written they are, you still end up having debates about what something is meant, or, or, or oh, we, we read this this way, or, and sometimes it's intentional, sometimes it's not intentional, but it, it doesn't allow a, a buyer to then say, no, we asked you to provide a solution. We didn't give you a list of requirements. We're not concerned about the how, we're concerned about the what. 
Um, of course, this is all easier said than done. It doesn't mean that you don't have requirements and performance metrics and that type of thing. What it does mean is that you're focused more on, on having the supplier own a solution rather than own a requirement. And in owning the solution, they are responsible for a comprehensive set of outcomes that are measured by a comprehensive set of service metrics that are all defined in those contracts. And so kind of focusing on that allows both parties a little more flexibility in, in both how they, how they um, respond to something as well as create the, a different set of expectations around what they need to deliver. Yeah, it sounds like there's a lot of benefits to really putting it out this way and, and that the buying organization can benefit further down the road once things are presented and outlined in this fashion. No, I think, I think that's true. And, and I'm sure that people have had experience both ways. I know that I think you still have to structure, uh, no matter how you do a procurement, the right structures have to be in place, the right metrics need to be in place, the right service levels need to be in place. Um, and, and expectations have to be clear on both sides. Um, th these, you know, especially in, in the world of technology where solutions are more complex, um, it's never a one-way street. Um, communications goes both ways. Oftentimes, because something is not executed correctly, um, it's because it wasn't communicated properly in the first place. And, and, you know, you see that repeatedly. So walking in with that type of understanding and then trying to foster better communications between parties is really where that solution-based approach um, has, has the most benefit. Great. Omar, have you worked with any clients that have built an RFP in this way? And what were some of the positive outcomes that were associated with that on their end? Yeah, I have. But before, before diving into that, I want to just elaborate on, on what Patrick just mentioned. Often what you'll find with the industry knows uh, best uh, in terms of what's out there, what the comp competitors are doing in a space. And so when you're relying back on the industry to kind of tell you what the state of the art is, uh, it helps you kind of go out to market with something that is representative and Quite frankly, um, when vendors look at it, it won't seem a little bit out, out to lunch in terms of what the requirements are. Because often what we see, especially with IT transformations, um, the process that was once in place uh, probably no longer needs to be followed in the exact same way. And so by dictating these things as, as a must have in an IT solution, you could be ruling out uh, potential suppliers from even bidding and, and providing you with a solution that might be even better. Now, back, back to your question, Amanda. I have seen it, and in fact, we've actually participated in a dialogue RFP of, of the sort, and they kind of follow the same uh, process that, that Patrick outlined. Uh, to be more specific, the organizations typically start by issuing invite to dialogue or an RFI, um, and this document is, is usually followed by a presentation uh, where all the proponents are kind of invited in to, to discuss the RFI. Now, the key point about this presentation is the organization telling the suppliers that we actually don't have a solution or one solution in mind, right? We have these things that we want to solve. We have these, you know, problems that we want to make go away. And we're willing to potentially work with several suppliers to put together the best solution. And again, this is the focus more on IT. So in this scenario, what you're going to get, suppliers are going to be more direct and honest in what their platforms can do what they're willing to customize, you know, how they're willing to integrate with other solutions. And this in return gives the organization a clear picture of the gaps that each solution has and how they can you know, provide and, and put together the right mix of technology and kind of apply the best and breed approach uh, to address their needs. And, and so I've seen that multiple times and, and the feedback that I hear at least from the clients is that it's a positive outcome because, again, you're relying on the industry to give you that, that feedback and you're going to market with something realistic and you end up with a solution that's more customized to your need. Fantastic. I think that was uh, great and very insightful from both of you and really gives us a look at how these actually come to life in the real world, which is always fantastic to see. So continuing our look at building the RFP in terms of contracting structure, how do teams set up the contract so that the service expectations are very clear, as we've said is very important to both the buyer and the supplier? Patrick, could you give us some background on this? Yeah, I, I, you know, this, this, this gets into the, the, you know, the arcane world of, of how, you, how you build and structure contracts. And, and you know, what, what I've found is that the contracts 
um, and, and what I've experienced both on, as a buyer as well as a, an advisor in, in these types of scenarios is the, the contract structures are, when, when they're designed well, can be used as the management framework for the relationship. And, and what does that mean? It doesn't mean that you're spending all day long staring at the terms and conditions and looking at whether or not somebody's met um, a, a term and, and therefore should be in breach because they didn't or whatever. It, it sets the performance metrics, the manner in which the performance metrics need to be, um, need to be measured. Um, it defines the governance processes. It defines the way that the solution needs to be delivered. It provides timelines and all of the guidelines that the parties agree to to be successful. And those, those elements of the, of the framework become parts of the contract that, um, that, that, that are all tied to, you know, your master services agreement, the thing with all the, you know, force majeure and all the, the, the fun legal stuff that ends up in your, in your big contracts. Um, but but you, have it all you have all the service elements tied into that master services agreement so that, so that when somebody is required to meet a date, that is a contractual term. You're not staring at a, a, a breach clause, but you're staring at something that the parties have agreed to that, that is achievable and that is, is important for the success of the program that is therefore defined inside the contract and inside those frameworks. So going about building the contracts go, goes beyond the, 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 the standard terms and conditions and then goes into how you structure and how you use those documents to clearly define outcomes, clearly define expectations across all parties and then clearly define the process to change things when they need to change. And I'm not talking change in the, in the technology sense. I'm talking change in the you know, business relationship sense. Um, and, and so you know, sometimes that takes a little work to, to get out of custom and practice of how contracts have, have typically been done. You know, I, I see frequently folks say, well, here's our structure, and it's always worked fine for us. Um, there are industry um, industry best practices around how, how you put these contracts together, how you put service levels together. Um, and, and there are ways in which the, the, the marketplace knows um, how to engage in these contract structures. So uh, that, that's an area that oftentimes it helps an organization to get, get a, uh, some other opinions on how to do things a little bit differently. But um, the, 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 the contracts, when, when framed properly and put together the right way, really help define the relationship and the outcomes and just make those expectations easier to understand and communicate. And building on that, are there any other agile tactics um, around this, uh, this issue that you've seen success with in terms of actually putting together, you know, the draft of the RFP or terms and conditions and things like that? Yeah, so some of the things that, you know, I know I've done and I've seen other organizations do is, um, for instance, uh, a, something called a, a request for qualified contractor. And I, I know other governments have different terms for it, but um, the idea in this case is it's one step beyond an RFI. It's not yet to an RFP, um, but you're, you're establishing the criteria that would enable um, a supplier to bid on a particular procurement. Basically, it's the, you know, are you tall enough to ride this ride idea? And you go through an evaluation process just like you would with an RFP. It's not as extensive, but it's clearly communicated to the market what you're looking for, the process you're going to use, and, and where it's going to lead. Um, and then once you've found those qualified contractors or suppliers, those that are um, capable of providing a service, um, then, then sometimes it, it makes sense to, to show them what the RFP is saying, give them a draft of what the RFP says. Um, and, then, and then that allows them to comment on it, to let them see what's coming. Uh, it gives you a preview of what the market thinks about the document you're producing and, and allows you then to, to demonstrate that you're willing to engage in a dialogue about uh, you know, what you're asking for and, and how you're gonna engage with, with those suppliers during the course of a procurement. Great, you mentioned um, earlier as well that really the key to agile, and it makes sense given the terminology and what we understand about it, is really the ability to adjust. So how do you incorporate adjustment opportunities into the RFP and the evaluation aspects as you're working through it? So some of the some of the tactics that, that we've seen be effective over the years are are um, things called and you, you have them up here things called clarifications or events rather called clarification sessions and integration sessions. Um, so the idea behind a clarification session 
is, is inviting suppliers into a room um, after the RFPs have been submitted to provide clarification for areas that, that, that might not be clear. Um, and the, the idea is that it needs to be well scripted, it needs to be well documented, and the, the suppliers who are participating all understand what the parameters are and that everybody in the process, and it could be two, it could be ten, but however many it is, are going to all have the same bite at the apple. Um, but in doing that, you, first of all, are engaging in dialogue, and you're demonstrating uh, a, a willingness to, to talk and a willingness to adjust solutions. Um, second of all, you're informing. You're, you're, you're asking them to uh, demonstrate their understanding of what it is that they put together, as well as develop or as well as answer questions about overlaps, um, inconsistencies, areas where there might have been a gap. And, and you're then signaling to them through the questions areas that they might want to go back and, and clarify their response. And then, you know, they're provided an opportunity to do so. Um, and, and, you know, some of the key points are here. But, but the biggest one is that they're scripted and documented, and, and the people who have been in your stakeholder team are the ones that are helping um, be involved in that or, or helping drive that process. Um, so you're having customers, for instance, uh, as the ones that are asking the suppliers questions during a clarification session. Um, an integration session is, is also an opportunity for dialogue, um, but in this case, um, an incoming supplier is trying to understand the type of environment that they're walking into. Um, sometimes that means that you need to understand who the other suppliers are. You need to understand how the, the organization that's going to manage the supplier is going to do that. Um, and, and this is a case where suppliers would have an opportunity to talk with other service providers about uh, existing solutions and, and where those touch points might be. Um, I've, I've seen these in the past where procurements are being run, two separate procurements are being run in parallel, and those procurements both have overlaps that, that um, would benefit all parties if they were sorted out um, prior to contract signing. So integration sessions were run um, with those two parallel uh, procurement processes, uh, suppliers coming into a room and kind of talking uh, about these areas of overlap um, with, with the customer leading the question. So um, even though they're separate, you know, these, these are not parties competing for the same business, um, different sets of business, but um, it, it helps to see where one party might be making an assumption about something they'd need to do when, in fact, that's scope that, that belongs to another supplier. So then you start to eliminate cost, you start to eliminate overlap, and you just make those outcomes a little more transparent and a little more understandable when you get to the point where you're signing a contract. It's a lot of fantastic information. I think it really gives us a much deeper and more detailed dive of, you know, how the evaluation aspects can really be uh, incorporated into this. Thank you. So after the evaluations, which we've just reviewed, you have your negotiations, which uh, would follow a similar path as traditional procurement would. And after a contract is in place, your stakeholders, who as we discussed were part of the process all along, would be able to start to take over delivery. And you can then use the framework to determine whether you're meeting outcomes and whether everything really is abiding by the clearly articulated contract. So switching gears now to talk about how to make this happen in your own organization. For some teams, it might seem like a stretch to launch into this right away. It is going to require some capacity building on the team generally. There's really no way that teams can take on this strategic, iterative approach if you're doing everything on paper or spreadsheets. And while many teams do have some digital tools in place, you might be, say, posting bids or RFP opportunities online, there's still a significant component of the evaluation process generally that's happening manually. So many organizations do have these digital tools in place, but again, the bid in the RFP is happening offline. Considering the sheer volume of paperwork involved in just a single RFP, let alone doing a multi-part process, such as you know, a request for a qualified contractor or clarification rounds, it would definitely be a significant administrative burden on the procurement team. Omar, how do you see technology fitting into the agile procurement process? Would you say it's a necessity for teams to have before they can begin running something like this? Uh, I wouldn't say maybe it's a necessity, but the process would be a lot easier to run and would help ensure fairness um, 
and transparency among suppliers with with technology. Uh, for example, a good e-sourcing suite should allow you to receive documentation from suppliers over multiple intervals and have their submissions slowly take shape in the platform. For example, after each dialogue session. Um, an e-sourcing tool would also help in the evaluation process of those documents, uh, whether it's for shortlisting suppliers you, as you hone in on the solution that you want, uh, to having multiple rounds of scoring that add up automatically to give you the final standings, uh, and of course at the end reporting and, and all of those uh, activities. So I wouldn't say it's, I wouldn't hold yourself back from going agile procurement because you don't have a platform, but it does definitely make it easier. Yeah, clearly digitizing the process really does free up teams to do agile procurement a lot more easily. And again, just touching on some of the points that you articulated, Omar, really freeing up time by, you know, taking some of those manual steps and creating automations for those. So no more spreadsheets, no more paper files, and just really ensuring that teams have clear visibility into the progress of bids and RFPs. So you're not spending as much time you know, following up, tracking down documents for reports. Another positive benefit is the collaborative workflows to engage with stakeholders. And e-sourcing software will allow you to collaborate with stakeholders online and really does provide a central place for project management of a bid or RFP. And it also provides really easy tools for your project owners and evaluators to review proposal documents, score online, and really make sure they're making those informed decisions. And finally, another key important point is this idea of automatic audit trails. So as we talked about, the key to defensibility is really a well-documented process. These systems take some of the manual work out of capturing and logging all the documents, stakeholders, and actions involved. So there's really less room for error, and it's a lot easier to pull those documents. Using an online bid system to manage the tactical aspect of bid posting, submission, and evaluation means that your procurement team can spend more time on the strategic aspects, as we've been talking today, of developing and carrying out the process, and really working with those stakeholders and suppliers to bring about a truly successful outcome for everyone. So in addition to technological requirements, there are also requirements from a people and management perspective. Patrick, from a skill set perspective, what is the most important skill set to develop to enable teams to really be able to run a truly successful agile procurement? Yeah, that's a that's a. I don't know that you can boil it down to one one skill set. I think that um, you know what what you're really trying to do is is gather um, all of the required skill sets necessary to help. Um, you know, build a case for change as well as develop the, the, the evaluation process and then implement it. Um, you, you've you've got you, to have a, a well understood, you know, a, a procurement team that is, is there to help um, facilitate and, and document the process. Um, you've got to have the, the customer base that's going to be engaged in helping you um, pull it all together. And then, of course, you have to have the, the, the right functions involved as you um, get get through the solutioning and, and through the evaluations, things like you know your contract management. Um, so I, I don't know that it's I don't know that it's one skill set in particular, um, but but you do have the need for um, folks who who are able to bring bring parties together, who are able to um, keep a process moving, keep teams together, uh, and then and then help facilitate. Um, the, the disagreements that happen within those teams as they occur, you know, during, during a process. Um, and, and, you know, in, in the course of things, you're, you're recognizing and bringing together all of the functions that are necessary to manage the relationship uh, once a contract is signed. And, you know, having that, having the, you know, the vision of the organization and the understanding of the organization to know, you know, who those people are and how they fit together you know, that, that, that to me is, is something that is, is the, um, if I were to call one thing out, that would be the skill set, but it requires a lot of skill sets. Um, just as any procurement does, it just, in, in, in bringing about an agile, trying to do an agile type approach, um, keeping all of those voices together and moving in the same way um, becomes the, the real trick of, of implementing this type of, uh, this type of procurement model. There's clearly a lot to really take into consideration which, with this type of procurement, but it really does seem that there's a positive correlation when all of these needs do come together. Yeah, I, I would. I I think so. I, I think so. It's um, nothing's nothing's easy. 
Um, but, but most things aren't impossible either. Great. So for those on the line, that's a great segue to who are thinking, you know, we're not there yet. Patrick, is there maybe a way that they can, you know, start getting started on a small scale with a more agile approach to procurement, even if it's not a truly agile procurement in and of itself? Yeah, absolutely. You, you, these, these, the, the elements of, of, a, of an agile process can all be looked at, you know, independently. You don't necessarily have to do an RFI. Um, you don't have to do a request for a qualified contractor. Um, you do need to do some type of market engagement. But, but putting those pieces together and saying we're going to test out a new way of doing things within a particular procurement, um, I, I think that's always a good way to start. Um, knowing what the plan, defining the plan before going in, um, understanding that you're going to try to do things a little bit differently, that you're going to challenge some conventional thinking, um, and that you're going to focus on documenting um, and, and being clear to the marketplace how you're going to go about doing things. Those become the, the key elements of starting, you know, whether it's at a small scale or a large scale, but, you know, managing the, the stakeholders through it um, and the responses you have to evaluate becomes less onerous when you start with something that, you know, first of all, starting on a single procurement, but secondly, starting on something that, that might be a smaller scale in scope. Great. And Omar, from a technology side of things, how would you suggest that teams get started on that front so that agile procurement can, in fact, be a reality and be a bit easier for them? Well, I'd like to start by emphasizing that even starting with e-sourcing technology itself, nowadays, it's so easy to implement a platform like this. And we're talking about a time span of about four to six weeks to be fully ramped up and running. And also with the fact that a lot of these platforms are now cloud-based, you know, the, the price for those platforms are definitely within reach for most organizations. Um, so the way I see it, one of the first steps of bringing agile procurement to your organization would be to equip yourself and your team with the right tools, you know, to enable you to go to market over multiple rounds to collect those documents, to score those documents uh, with the evaluation committee all online as well, and to do all of this seamlessly in a fair and transparent way. Uh, again, I don't want to introduce an obstacle. If you certainly have a project like Patrick mentioned that you want to start with, absolutely, I think that's a first step forward. Um, but also starting with technology is not a bad start specifically because uh, they're, they're kind of nimble tools out there now that can help you get there. Fantastic. Well, I think we've covered a lot of really detailed information here and really given everyone on the line a lot to consider. So at this point, we'd just like to turn it over to those of you on the line to address any questions that you have and really go through those and see how we can help on that front. Thanks, Amanda. So our first question, I find when an RFI is being considered, the client already has in mind what they are looking for and or what vendor they want to work with. If they are being transparent and don't invite all respondents to the RFI, to have that discussion, to see what is going on in the marketplace, the solicitation document is therefore created by only one vendor's comments. Not sure if there is a way to get around this. Patrick, maybe you want to uh, provide your opinion on that and give us some thoughts? Yeah, I think, you know, I, I just, I have, um, you know, I have different experiences with RFIs. I, I, think, I, I think that when you're at the point where, let, let, me, let me take a step back. There's always a different situation for buyers when you get to the point of asking for an RFI. Sometimes you know what you want. There's nothing wrong with that. We as individuals all say some days, if we, we decide we want to go buy uh, a Chevy Camaro, we know what we want. We might not know what the right color is, but we know what we want, and we're going to go research that. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Um, it might even be the case that you already know who the best in breed is, and you say, this is the person that I want to provide a service or, or, um, or product. Um, once again, nothing wrong with that. You still, all, the, all the rules about procuring things still have to apply. But if you know who you want and what you want and, and there's a way to go about getting it, well, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. I think, um, in, in, I think the case studies that we're talking about, we were talking about earlier, is when you know that there's a broad market and you know that there are multiple providers that can come in and do things that you believe to be similar and you're trying to go out and get the best value for your government. And, and in doing that, you want to have the best competition you can possibly have. You want to ask for the right things so that the responses you receive are comparable. 
That's the case where engaging with the marketplace um, through an RFI or similar process becomes really valuable um, because you signal to them what's coming. You start to pull the market in and inform yourselves of how to ask for things, and you make it clear to them how you're going to go about um, the next steps. And, and in those cases, um, you're absolutely broadcasting far and wide. You want as many respondents in as you possibly can so that eventually you, you're able to narrow them down based on your, your selection criteria um, and get the, get, the best, um, the, the, get the best provider through, through a competitive bid. Thanks, Patrick. Are there alternatives that governments can use to RFIs that the panel would recommend that are better fit for preparing specifically for an agile procurement? I, you know, I think that, I think that the, the RFI, you know, the RFI is a tool. Um, there are a number of ways. You can have an industry day, for instance, but the point is creating a mechanism by which you get the you get the market in and ready for what it is you're asking for. And, and is that a necessary component of an agile process? No, I would argue it's a necessary component of any procurement process. That informing, informing yourself, being an informed buyer is very important. And you cannot, inf I, I contend, you cannot inform yourself as a buyer just by, re just by reading RFP responses. I think that an RFI process or something similar um, is a necessary component of any procurement process. Um, but with that said, you know, are there other mechanisms to do it? Absolutely. You know, there are RFIs. More importantly, there's, there's the dialogue um, and inviting folks in to have supplier days um, based on certain criteria uh, and, and certain questions that need to be answered. Um, hosting, you know, ho the government entity hosting webinars with, with the marketplace, um, explaining what it is they're looking for. I mean, there are a number of ways to create that dialogue between um, the market and the buyer. The only thing I would add to that is I think using the term RFI, especially with an experienced internal stakeholder, might already put them into that mindset of we're doing RFI, collect some requirements and do an RFP the traditional way. And so it's almost like starting brand new if you're planning to do agile procurement to just call it something different even like an invite to dialogue. Uh, or as Patrick suggested, have an industry day, just to kind of set the tone, this is something new, this is something different, and, and setting the expectations from that point. Yeah, that's a good point, Omar. I, that, that's, yeah, that, that's dead on. Have any agencies that are doing agile procurements and projects developed the service agreement template you use for these type, types of engagements? Well, I think, um, you know, I'll take the first crack at that, Omar, and I'm sure that, that you've got some thoughts on it as well. Um, I, I, I don't know every agency in the country who has done an agile procurement. I think that I'm sure that folks have developed processes along the way. Um, I know, I know in, 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 you know, some of the work I do that that's, that's part of it is, is defining, is setting up that, that process of how to go through, um, you know, an agile procurement. So I, I know that there are processes I know that there are industry approaches to doing that, and, and I'm sure that you know, some agencies that are going through it are, are developing you know, their, their way of, of doing an agile engagement. Yeah, I don't have any on top of my head here, but if you touch base with us, I can uh, reach out some clients and see if they have something like this that we can pass along. If you give a draft of the RFP to a supplier for input, are you giving that supplier an unfair advantage? Yeah, Omar, I'll, I'll kick this off because I think this is, um, you know, it's um, responding to some of the dialogue earlier about, uh, about how, to, how to get some supplier input. I, I think in, in that particular case that I was talking about, the idea was, um, you, you, have already, you have already qualified participants. In other words, you've already gone to the marketplace and said, um, we are looking for uh, suppliers that meet certain criteria, and we are going to select from the, the people who respond a certain number who will be eligible to receive the RFP. All right, in doing that now, you, you, have, you have told the marketplace, um, I'm going to have a down select. Um, and I'm going to give those who are down selected the, an opportunity to, to give comment on the RFP. Uh, so at that point, everybody who is now behind the qualified wall to participate in the procurement is getting the RFP. So you're not giving an unfair advantage to anybody.
For the clarification sessions, do you recommend it as a session for all suppliers at once, or is it segmented? The way um, the way I've typically seen them done and, and run them is is as segmented. Um, it's suppliers coming in um, one at a time. That's one of the challenges is making sure that you're not that suppliers feel comfortable in the dialogue and that they're not giving away elements of the solution. So the idea is not to put them in that situation. The idea is to help clarify um, between the buyer and the and the seller what's in the solution um, and and therefore improve both the, the the solution set, the outcomes, and the price. Yeah, I will elaborate on that too. Yeah, I've only seen it as uh, separate meetings that they're had. And usually uh, I've also seen very, very large uh, infrastructure projects that are construction, like building hospitals at that level, where the whole uh, process laid out early on, where we, they say, we're going to have, you know, meeting number one, and then everybody gets invited that same day. And everybody has an hour to clarify. They go out, they do more analysis, come back, submit additional documents, and they have meeting number two. And the whole structure actually is laid out ahead of time. So all the suppliers know what they're signing yep. up for uh, as part of that process. Yep. Thanks, Omar. This is to piggyback off the first question that we had. Uh, what about the use of citywide contracts or statewide contracts? When several of your stakeholders do not want to use these contracts, how would you suggest handling this issue? Omar, you can go first. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's ultimately it goes back to the, the, the problem you're trying to solve. And if those contracts that you have access to, presumably through cooperative uh, agreements, do not fit the bill, then we're going to fall into that same um, issue that we talked about earlier with, you know, the low success rate of IT procurement. So I think I, think I would always go back to the data uh, and, and use that to kind of make prime point of why we actually have to go through a process this time. Yeah, you, you see this a lot. I mean, I, in the services world, you see it a lot. And it doesn't just have to be technology. But, you know, your services solutions, um, for instance, tend to look at um, pricing differently. So you get a laptop in a services contract that might look like it's a lot more expensive than one you get at Best Buy. Well, also included in that laptop in your services contract is the security. It's the, it's the IMAX. It's the um, it's the, the imaging, it's the, the, the patches, it's all of the service that goes into maintaining that, which you don't get when you go to Best Buy. So, you know, sometimes making sure that people understand what's in the contracts and why something might be different becomes part of, you know, the, the, the discussion of which contract is a better buying vehicle. And what is the most common cost model for agile contracts, is it, is it a guaranteed maximum price? I haven't seen uh, them being so strict as, as something like this. Um, it's more of, at the end of the day, as you're developing the solution, you're arriving at something that more or less mimics what you want to solve uh, from the vendor's point of view. And then they just submit the price, but there's no guarantee that I've seen anyway. Yeah, and you see now a lot of consumption-based pricing. Um, you know, again, that you see most of that. That that's a lot of that's in the technology space, and and so you're 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 developing bands around pricing based on the consumption that the, the buyer is using, um, and and so you know, and then over time, how that pricing um, is impacted by con by changes in consumption is defined in your defined in your contracts. But there's not necessarily a guarantee. And our last question, if anybody has any other uh, questions, please input those in the Q&A box. Our procurement process includes pre-proposal meetings as well as letters of clarification to notify any prospective clients regarding questions which have arisen during the procurement phase. What other processes can be utilized to create more of a dialogue once the process has already begun? Omar, you want to kick it off and I'll follow you? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's at the end of the day, uh, you probably want to be careful. Like, I'm assuming here that you have a project maybe in mind or the project is already out there and now you want to start the dialogue phase. I would say it has to be even earlier in the process. Uh, if the project is already out there uh, and out in the wild, it's probably not a good idea to, you know, get people to start participating in these dialogue phases. So I would say if you are thinking about agile procurement, it's 
even at the planning stage that you want to uh, clarify that internally with your team, get buy-in internally. And then when you go out to market, the vendor community already knows this is the process you're going to follow. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think, um, you know, it's great that you're doing the proposal meetings and the letters of clarification. Um, so you're, you're providing that feedback. I think that, um, you know, I, I've, I've found that the, the dialogue um, is as important as the letter of clarification. So you could supplement the letter with, with a face-to-face -face meeting to make sure that things are, are, um, are, are, are understood. Uh, it also sends a signal. I, I just think in general, you know, having, having the dialogue sends a different signal because you're, you're building a, a, a deeper understanding of how folks are going to, to, to work together over a period of time. Um, but then to get into other things during the process, you know, um, you, you, can have, you can have down select moments, um, and I'm, I'm, you probably do, but, but the down select moments can also involve clarification sessions. Um, that allow um, the supplier after a down select to, you know, revise further. And then you have other things like, you know, your best and final offer, which, which tends to be pretty standard. But, but the, the events around the bath, though, like um, some type of dialogue or some type of event um, is, is something that can be incorporated into the process. Um, and then, you know, we talked about the integration sessions where um, you, you might bring in a potential supplier to meet with um, another supplier who's either an incumbent or that you're also going through a procurement with to help uh, identify overlaps or, or points of integration between various parties. Thank you, Patrick. And we have no other questions. Uh, if you have any last minute questions, please put those in the Q&A box. Um, if we don't have any other questions, does our panel have any other closing thoughts or comments? I just wanted to thank everyone for joining us today. We hope that you found this to be informative and that uh, you're taking away a lot of information that you can hopefully begin uh, using to impact your organization. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us and see how we can help further. I too would like to thank our panel, uh, Patrick, Omar, and Amanda. I hope everyone enjoyed this webinar. Please take time to fill out the evaluation survey. A link containing the survey and a recording of this webinar will be emailed to everyone tomorrow. Thanks again and have a great day.